Welcome to another exciting video on the fossil record. My name is Benjamin Berger, and it was recently suggested that I do a video on the bizarre and strange creatures known as Dicynodonts. An often overlooked group, these early synapsid mammal-like reptiles lived during the Permian and Triassic periods and witnessed one of the most calamitous periods in Earth's history. Today, they are overshadowed by dinosaurs in the popular imagination of the public, which arose during the final days of the Dicynodonts in the late Triassic period. So who were these bizarre and ancient creatures? During the Pennsylvanian period in Earth's history, three major groups of four-limbed, hard-shelled, egg-laying amiotes appeared. The anapsid reptiles like Capurinus, the diapsid reptiles like Petrolacosaurus, and the synapsid reptiles like Demetrodon. These three groups are characterized by the number of openings in the posterior part of the skull. So in anapsids, there are no openings, while diapsids have two openings and synapsids have only one opening. The synapsids are a group that would later evolve into mammals, including you. In fact, you can actually feel the single opening in your own skull by running your hand over your cheekbone or zygomatic arch in which there's a muscle called the temporalis that passes below that bone. And it is this muscle that passes through this opening into the skull that gives mammals such as you such a great bite strength. Dicynodonts belong to the synapsids, and it was this really strong bite that Dicynodonts took full advantage of. They became very diverse during the late Permian period, and although many species succumbed to the great dying at the conclusion of the Permian period and the Paleozoic era, they were able to survive into the Triassic period. They lived from 273 million to 209 million years ago, a span of 64 million years, nearly as long as our group, the primates, have been on Earth. So they were very, very successful. What made them so successful was this opening for the large temporalis muscle, giving them the ability to bite and chew food, particularly plants. Something that anapsids and diapsids struggled with. It was not until the advent of dinosaurs that we see dicynodonts decrease and eventually become extinct during the late Triassic with the last members from the Norian stage of the Triassic, just when dinosaurs like Coelophysis were becoming diverse. Dicynodonts are the first major evolutionary branch of synapsids, leading to modern mammals, a group called the Therapsidae. Now, the Therapsidae arose from an early Permian group called the Briar Musukia, which had enlarged the temporal fenestra. In fact, the name Thera means mammal and Apsia means archer opening. So the therapsia had a more mammalian, modern mammalian temporal fenestra, bigger opening than the previous pelicosaurs like Demetriodon, which had a really small temporal fenestra. The Briarsuchia still closely resembled the pelicosaurs or sphenicodonts in their primitive general anatomy. But they had a number of advanced features, such as a more upright head and body posture and reduced number of teeth. With enlarged canine-like teeth, it was these enlarged canine teeth that came into fashion with dicynodonts. So what characterizes dicynodonts? Well, first they have 
a short, stout skull that kind of resembles a pug dog, a reduced pterygoid bone, and an expanded cranial space for the temporalis muscle. The cheekbone is emarginated upward, forming a large, wide temporal fenestra for the passage of the temporalis muscle. And the lower jaw is missing the coronid bone and is peg-like. There's a unique groove in the jaw hinge that permits the lower jaw to slide back and forth, allowing the animal to chew. They also have a groove on the outer side of the lower jaw called the intramandibular fenestra, which allows blood vessels and nerves to pass through the lower jaw. Most dicynodonts lack teeth, except for two enlarged canine teeth on either side of the maxillary bones of the skull. These teeth hang down and give them their name, di meaning two, sino meaning dog, and daunt meaning tooth. Their name, dicynodont, means two dog teeth. Lacking other teeth, later dicynodonts developed a beak, or ramathecia, which was a keratin-covered biting surface, uh, similar to turtles and birds. These beaks were useful in eating spore-borne ferns and horsetails, which were the dominant plant at the time along waterways where they grew uh, plentifully. Having an opening in the top of the skull called the pineal opening allowed light to shine on the pineal gland of the brain, which likely was used in the coordination of seasonal reproductive cycles and diurnal thermal regulation. As dicynodonts were likely cold-blooded with a slow metabolism with exothermic regulation of their body temperature. Having a sense organ for light may have helped them regulate body temperatures during a period of time that the earth was particularly hot climatically, as ecologically earth was a desert planet for most of the late Permian and early Triassic periods. They thrived in the warmer climates of this time period. The postcranial skeleton of dicynodonts demonstrates a slow plodding animal that was not adapted towards speed. They exhibited a large broad shoulder girdle with a large procoracoid and coracoid bones, which in modern mammals are fused with the scapula. The humerus or upper arm bone was broad and wide for strength. Insertion and origination of the deltoid muscles gave dicynodonts strong forelimbs, useful for digging. Dicynodonts had to contend with predators like the swift gorgonopsids without much in the sense of defenses. They could not smell very well and they had poor hearing. Small dicynodonts may have been nocturnal with others living in burrows underground. One adaptation to avoid predators was to get really, really big. In fact, dicynodonts were the largest tetrapods living at the time. Rachacephalus, a Permian diapsid from Africa, got to cow size, while Triassic forms got even larger. The recently described Leswickia was the size of a modern elephant. Such large sizes allowed dicynodonts to contend with fast-moving predators. They could just stomp on them. Fossil dicynodonts have been known for a long time. The early paleo artist Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins uh, made lifelike reconstructions of dicynodonts alongside dinosaurs back in the 1850s. One of the most interesting aspects of dicynodonts is their geographic distribution uh, during the late Permian and Triassic periods when all of the continents were assembled into a single continent called Pangaea. 
In fact, it was the fossil record of dicynodonts that provided some of the strongest evidence for plate tectonics in the 1960s and 1970s. The dicynodont Lystrosaurus has a peculiar distribution with fossils found in South Africa, India, Antarctica, and China and has become a textbook example of evidence for plate tectonics and continental drift. The biogeography of dicynodonts is peculiar as well as in the changes of the distribution of fossils through time. So during the early Permian, dicynodonts arose in Russia with early toothed dicynodonts like Dimacrodon and uh, Osteria However, as the climate warmed during the late Permian, dicynodonts expanded their range southward along the coastline of the Paleotethys Sea, with a diverse late Permian fauna in South Africa and Antarctica, as well as in Europe. Now, Permian dicynodonts did not make it to North America, and this is because of the giant Appalachian mountain range which limited North America's fauna to early Sphenacodonts or Pelicosaurs living during the late Permian in Utah, Colorado, and Texas. Dicynodonts were found pretty much everywhere else during the late Permian, but it is in Africa that we have the best record of dicynodonts during this time. Now, dicynodonts uh, reached their zenith during the late Permian with nearly 40 genera recognized, with most fossils occurring in the fossil-rich deposits of the Karun Basin of South Africa. But things took a sad turn during the Great Dying at the end of the Permian. Not all dicynodonts survived the Great Dying event. The successful dicynodont that actually made it through the world's worst mass extinction event was Lestratosaurus a medium-sized dicynodont, which was common after the extinction. In fact, the period of time is recognized in the rock record as the Lestratosaurus zone. Now, dicynodonts uh, never regained the species diversity that they had had in the late Permian, in the later Triassic period, um, but they did finally make it over those high mountains and they entered into North America during the late Triassic period uh, with the fossil named Placeris from Arizona. The Triassic period brought new fast predators. Archosaurs and therapsid mammals exhibited specialization for warm-bloodedness. And these fast-moving predators required more food to maintain their hot, hot, higher running temperatures. And the cold-blooded dicynodonts were a particularly good food source. Now to cope, dicynodonts grew larger and larger. The early dicynodont Kenomyria was a meter and a half long, a turtle-like creature that was common in Africa and South America, with forms in China known as well. And Urala caramaria from Russia was a little bit larger, with a skull half a meter long. The late Triassic saw the presence of Stalacaria from Brazil, which is over three meters long. Placeris from the late Triassic of North America was 3.5 meters long, with the recent Lithwickia from Poland continuing this trend with an estimated length of over 4.5 meters long. While dicynodonts were reaching these gigantic sizes, they were becoming less and less diverse. Liswickia, the largest genus known, was also the last dicynodont. Dicynodonts as a group went extinct around 209 million years ago in the late Triassic just as the dinosaurs were starting their ascent into becoming the dominant terrestrial life forms of planet Earth. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more, I found uh, Gillian King's book, 
the Dicynodonts, a study in paleobiology, a very useful source of information. So if you want to learn more about Dicynodonts, I recommend this book as there's really not that many uh, books on Dicynodonts out there. I also want to thank my Patreons, um, Brian Clever, Pablo Luzato Figuez, Arctotis1811, Justin Bovey, and my newest supporter, Alan uh, Williamson. Um, and my trilobite supporters um, for encouraging me to make these uh, fun extra videos on the fossil record. So if you'd like to support these videos, check out the link below and let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos to add to this collection.